dear friends, thank you for joining us today. And particularly, very dear excellence, thank you for joining us. Ambassadors, it's so important that you agreed to discuss uh, today how Ukraine and our friends and allies uh, can manage together threats against security of all of us. I am happy that yesterday is host of this conversation with the representatives in Ukraine of Canada, Germany, France, the United Kingdom, and the United States. I hand over to our moderator, Chairman of the Board of Yes and President, Alexander Kovstensky. Mr. President, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Uh, hello. Good afternoon. Good morning. Um, uh, I'm very honored to moderate um, today's conversation. And because we have uh, very limited time, only one hour, and the interest is absolutely huge because we have more than 480 registrations. So um, I start um, uh, to introduce our uh, special guests, and I am very grateful to you that you decided to participate in our discussion. So um, Ambassador of Canada to Ukraine, Larissa Galwadze, Anke Feldhusen, Ambassador of Germany to Ukraine, Mr. Etienne de Poncins, Ambassador of France to Ukraine, uh, Madame Melinda Simons, uh, Her Majesty's Ambassador to Ukraine, and by video address, we will host, we will have also Joseph Pennington, Chargé d'Affaires of the United States in Ukraine. We have also very special guests, uh, former Prime Minister of uh, Sweden, Karl Bildt, and um, uh, diplomat and former Ambassador of the United States to Ukraine, John Herbs. And uh, I will ask uh, both of our friends to make some comments uh, after the round of questions and answers of uh, Excellencies Ambassadors. And, um, you know, the introduction is, is not needed because we know the situation in Ukraine in the last days, in last months was, was very uh, dramatic. Uh, again, Ukraine was on the front pages of uh, uh, newspapers uh, in, in media in the world. We were very much afraid um, uh, because of Russian politics. And we are a little bit more relaxed now after the last decisions of Putin to retreat uh, this uh, huge group of uh, soldiers, more than 100,000 from, uh, from the Donetsk and Lugansk uh, region. But of course, uh, because of the problem is, is, is uh, quite uh, uh, complicated, deep and, and historical, and still we don't know what can happen in the, in the future. I think our discussion is very valuable and the questions are very very important as well. And please uh, let me, uh, allow me to uh, start with uh, the same questions to two ambassadors, ambassador of Germany and ambassador of France. Do you think that retreat of forces means the situation stabilizes? And um, please uh, give us your judgment, your opinion uh, about the reaction of the European Union and uh, your countries, especially Germany and France. Uh, do you think that everything was done correctly? It was done in 100% or um, some mistakes uh, um, uh, happened and what we should do in, in, in the future? Uh, such very important question to you is, uh, should European Union countries give weapons to Ukraine? Because this is a very sensitive issue and sensitive problem. So the questions are quite uh, short, but I understand the answers are not so um, short, but please uh, respect that we have one hour only. The screen is yours. Maybe we start with the German ambassador. Thank you very much, Mr. President. That was a lot of questions. So, um, let me uh, briefly say that, yes, of course, also Germany and I guess France too, we were rather surprised at the huge military buildup uh, um, at the border not surprised in a way that we did not know before that Russia already had uh, thousands and thousands uh, of soldiers uh, at Ukrainian's borders uh, and also is supporting uh, um, the so-called republics uh, in the East uh, militarily. Yeah. Um, but uh, we watched uh, the movements of the Russian troops uh, uh, 
um, with a lot of attention, uh, with a lot of concern. Uh, um, and I think we very quickly got uh, together, all of us, not only France and Germany, yeah, but also in the format uh, with the US and Great Britain and with the wider G7 format. And I think we relatively quickly um, gave an answer to Mr. Putin uh, in not in a military way, yeah, with words, but I think we stood firmly on Ukraine's side uh, um, with our latest uh, G7 uh, um, statement, uh, asking him to, to also um, take away uh, uh, his new troops. Again, uh, Ms. our Chancellor, uh, Ms. Merkel, asked the same of him when she, uh, when she talked to him on the phone. So um, I do think he did get quite a, a quick answer uh, from us. Um, since I don't have much time and you asked also for the European um, uh, reaction and weapons, uh, you know that Germany is in a difficult situation when it comes to export of weapons uh, to countries in conflict. Uh, we have a rather long-standing tradition there. We are in contact with our Ukrainian uh, partners on that. What we do is we do try to help the Ukrainian armed forces by um, really very intensely here improving their um, medical facilities. Uh, we have been doing so for the last five um, years. And I'm very happy to see here that the military service of the Ukrainian armed forces is uh, right now looking rather like the German ones, uh, which have a really good reputation. I think I stop with that for the time being and hand over to my French colleague. Yes, please. Ambassador of France. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Yes, maybe a few words just to, to complement what uh, um, Anka has, has just said. Yes, we were we were a bit surprised to be to be perfectly frank by, by uh, the buildup uh, at the borders of, of Ukraine, but I think we, we reacted quite quite rapidly uh, in connection with our British and U.S. and uh, Canadian uh, and American colleagues. So there was a, a very quick and, and positive response. Uh, um, and in, in, that, in that context, uh, the, the fact that uh, President Zelensky visited Paris, uh, it was planned in advance, so there was nothing to do with, 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 with the build-up because it was planned for, for, for weeks. But anyway, it, it came at a very timely moment and it, it, was, it gave uh, us, uh, I mean France and Germany, to, because there was a trilateral in the afternoon after the head-to-head -head, uh, between our two presidents, um, there was this capacity to, to send a strong signal of support to, to Zelensky and um, more generally to the, from the international community to, to Ukraine. Regarding the weapons, um, we are in a different position than, than, than Germany, but, but anyway, as we are, um, France and Germany, Mediator at the Normandy 4 format, and we insist on this role. We, we are not part, we are just mediator. I mean, we, we are doing a lot of work uh, of uh, go between between uh, Ukraine and, uh, and Russia. Um, I mean, the French president and the, the German chancellor. Uh, we have to, to adopt quite um, a posture of, uh, of, of uh, restraint, I, I would say. So France, yes, we, we can provide some military equipment. Defensive one, uh, we have to we look uh, case by case, so it, it goes through a, a special procedure. We are not completely limited, but, but we, we, we pay attention to, to, to that matter. And for the moment, we restrict ourselves to, to defensive equipment such as uh, patrol boats and uh, this kind of, of equipment, but a uh, lethal weapon, we, we, we are in a more difficult position. Thank you, Thank you very much. And uh, I have additional question to both of you. Uh, from your position, from your perspective, how do you understand, how do you explain this uh, last decision of Putin to retreat the forces, to accept the meeting with President Zelensky? You have some your vision that is really the signal of something or that is only tactical move? Perhaps I start again? Uh, yes, President, please, please, ladies okay. first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, since I have been in this country for quite some time and have seen what happened in 2014-15 too, um, I, I do think um, that Mr. Putin is very good in uh, catching our attention and taking our time, energy yeah, and nerves. And I think a lot of what he did this time is the same. He tested us, he tested the West, he tested, but I guess my American colleague will say more on that, uh, the new US administration also. Um, and when he feels 
um, pressure from the other side, he's also very capable of quickly re retracting yeah, and changing his plans. I think that's what we're seeing now. I'm not at all convinced that that is the end of the story. I think uh, the, the Russian military buildup will be with us uh, at least until after the exercises of Zapa 21. Uh, um, uh, and he is in the comfortable position to be a threat anytime to Ukraine. And we will have to be very careful, have to be watching that very intensely. But as I said, I think this is also part of his intention. He, he wants us to to spend a lot of time looking what he's doing and wondering what are his um, what is his strategy here. Yeah, and I think this is for us very difficult to see. For the time we are, as you said, more relaxed because uh, some of the troops have been taken back. But I'm absolutely convinced this is not the end of the story. Yeah. It's much more tactics as a strategy. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yes, Monsieur Ambassador. Yeah, I, I fully agree. This is tactic, and we have also to to distinguish between the troops. I mean, the men uh, and the material and the, the the equipment. The equipment is still there and uh, is supposed to to stay. And we have also to to take into account the calendar. We are coming into the Easter break, so for for troops, they have come with the uh, equipment and now they go back to the family because it's time for a family uh, uh, moment. Um, and we have also to look ahead because it's not the end of the story. There will be some important moments in the coming uh, months and in particular the celebration of the 30th anniversary of Ukraine independence, 23rd and 24th of, Mar of August. And uh, so the build-up is not over, I, I would say. The troops have gone for a while, but the build-up is not over. This is our view. And Thank the you. Signal, maybe just yeah. a last one. The signal please, please. From, from from Russia has been sent, so they have, uh, they have put again the, this conflict on the uh, on the map. If I can say that, and we can see already, from example, from a reaction of uh, foreign investors, that the signal that this country, Ukraine, is still not in danger, but it's not secure, uh, has been well received, I must, I must say, unfortunately, by, by foreign investors, and they are much more cautious now uh, about Ukraine than they, they were um, only a few, few weeks ago. So from a Moscow perspective, the signal has been sent and received, unfortunately. Yeah, this is, I think this is a very important point, because this picture of destabilized Ukraine, that is something what... Russia wants to create permanently. That's that's uh, by propaganda, but also by such decision. Thank you. And now I want to ask uh, Ambassador of Canada, Lisa Galadze. Uh, Canada has uh, 200 Canadian Armed Forces members in Ukraine constantly. Uh, you are very vocal in support for Ukraine. Uh, were you happy with the coordination of the international community? Uh, what must be improved? And uh, the very important general question, in your opinion, Ukraine should join NATO or that is impossible now? Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to, to be a part of this. Um, I'll get straight to your answers. Uh, I think we've all heard strong consensus that the international community's political and diplomatic uh, response was robust, it was timely and it was clear. And as, a, as an ambassador of a G7 country, a NATO ally, and a member of the Five Eyes community sitting here in Kyiv, I can say personally, I was I was happy. But you know, let's be clear, this doesn't happen by accident. The coordination was taking place everywhere here. It was taking place at NATO. It was taking place at the OSCE, among the G7 at the foreign ministers level, and between uh, the military and the political arms of all the concerned uh, governments. And it was it was very active. And on top of that, we had the bilateral discussions uh, that each of our countries had with Ukraine. And here, I think it's really important to give credit to President Zelensky, to Minister Kuleba, Minister Taran, and General Komchak. They did an excellent job of reaching out, of engaging, of passing uh, clear messages, and to be seen in the company of these strong supporters. So Ukraine's uh, diplomatic and, and, and political machines, I think, spun up very quickly. You mentioned Op Unifier. Yes, uh, we are very proud of our, our presence here with 200 Canadian Armed Forces troops. They are here as an unarmed uh, training mission and they would never be used for, for any other roles. Um, but it's the strong international and bilateral coordination around military training, I think, that allowed many to say, 
in this last, uh, the episode of the last uh, five weeks, that the Ukrainian armed forces of 2021 are not the Ukrainian armed forces of 2014. And we're really proud to have been a part of that. So at all levels, I think the more our systems work together, whether it's tactical training or our leaders talking, um, the more we work together, the better uh, the response becomes. I think that uh, the more we work together also, the better our information sharing will, will be and our intelligence sharing uh, will be. Um, and this, this just helps to ensure that we see the same picture and that we can have a coherent discussion about what's happening. And I think here the Enhanced Opportunities Program offers uh, more opportunities, more chances to get better at that information sharing at understanding each other and at the intelligence uh, uh, sharing. Um, so your, your question about NATO, the question's been answered, and this is not a matter of, of, of my opinion. The Allies answered it in 2008 in Bucharest. The open door policy remains in place, and Canada is a very strong supporter of that. Uh, Ukrainians enshrined this path in their constitution, and we see a continued uh, uh, steady growth in the support for this Euro-Atlantic trajectory. So, uh, so it's, 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 is there, the commitment is there on both sides. And we also are increasingly realizing that the NATO-Ukraine relationship is a benefit, a benefit to both sides, not just in terms of the interoperability on the technical and the military sense, but the interoperability of the values that we share. It's a coalescing around the values and the principles that NATO was established to protect democracy, rule of law, human rights, the peaceful resolution of conflict. Our countries want a Ukraine that is a part of this club, uh, which is why we unwaveringly support Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty, but also deliver tough messages about things like judicial reform, about central bank independence, about uh, the reform of state-owned enterprises and all those many other issues uh, that you see us individually and collectively as the, as the G7 in particular, uh, speaking out about quite uh, strongly. I've said a lot about the state to state relationship and the government and institutional reforms. I think it's also important to talk about people. And we've all heard it said that Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, did a lot to galvanize uh, Ukrainian uh, unity and did so in a way that previously wasn't, was, hadn't been seen. I think as we look forward to peace, uh, it's important to anticipate that there will be challenges and there will be spoilers. Uh, and that reintegration has to be deliberate and it needs to be anticipated in advance. Uh, the sustainable peace it won't just happen, it needs to be built by people. First, the people need to be firmly behind President Zelensky when he goes into negotiations. And secondly, the people need to implement the peace in their hearts and their minds and their communities. Um, Vice Prime Minister Reznikov, I think several months ago, did a uh, did a, a, a good thing by releasing informally a draft law on that transitional period that raises, in a very timely way, I think, some of the sensitive issues that people will have to come to gr grips with uh, in 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 implementing property rights, transitional administration, the timing of elections, amnesty, and more. And I think if there's no national dialogue or consensus. Um, then peace will just bring, ironically, uh, a, a shattering of, of, that, of that unity that we, that we currently see. Um, I think the platforms for that are micro platforms at the moment by Ukrainians, for Ukrainians, and learning the lessons uh, that the international community uh, has on offer. Um, some great examples are emerging in Ukraine on this. The Center for Human Capital, uh, with Canada's support, is, uh, is engaging in this dialogue for, for unity, focus groups to test scenarios for a peaceful settlement. The Analytical Center of the Ukrainian Catholic University is uh, looking at a pro doing a project uh, on uh, looking at unity of Ukraine in the context of the temporarily occupied territories on the aspects of values, the psychology, social security, and the economic dynamics. So these kinds of discussions are important, but I think those grassroots discussions about peace in those little Maidanchike are, uh, are really important. Um, it's all a journey, whether it's the next time we have to work together 
to counter the kind of uh, the kind of threat that Russia uh, uh, poses on the border of Ukraine, whether it's the journey to uh, to to NATO or whether it's the journey of the Ukrainian people into a peaceful resolution of this conflict. Uh, Canada is really proud to be a part of it and very glad to uh, to be in that with with the kinds of friends we have on on the event today. Thank you, Madam Ambassador. It was uh, very interesting, especially when you mentioned this question of uh, platform for such a national dialogue on peace, etc. My question, additional question is, in your opinion, you are in Kiev now, you, you have a lot of opportunities, opportunities to discuss with Ukrainian colleagues this issue. What kind of this peace resolution would be accepted widely by Ukrainians today? What, because, you know, each deal means some kind of compromise. And I'm very much afraid that this even small compromise cannot be accepted by by majority of, of, of the people. Well, what is your impression? You're absolutely correct. And what we also hear from people it, is that there is international consensus on what that compromise might be. Uh, and these, these discussions that are taking place, again, Center for uh, Human Capital, um, smaller discussions taking place, um, are going to tease out from people what kinds of compromise are, um, what kinds of what kinds of conditions they would accept uh, for peace. And that needs to happen uh, very close to the contact line, on the other side of the contact line, however that might happen, it needs to happen far away from the contact line uh, as well. Everybody needs to be engaged in that. And we need to hear the voices uh, of, of, Ukraine, of Ukrainians in that dialogue. That's who matters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now the questions to... Uh, Her Majesty's Ambassador to Ukraine, Melinda Simons. General the same. what is your opinion about these last decisions of, of Putin, what means for the, this, um, for the future? Secondly, what is your UK scenario? Because we know that uh, uh, after this um, uh, build-up uh, decisions from Russia, United States announced that two warships um, would enter the Black Sea, but then reversed uh, their decision. UK sent ships to arrive in a few weeks, uh, and uh, as far as I know, has not reversed course. That's, uh, could you explain your uh, position and, and the prospect, how it can uh, develop in, in, in the coming months? Sure, thank you very much. And thanks for inviting me this afternoon. It's good to see my ambassador colleagues on, uh, on screen, as <laughs> ever. Um, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, try to speak briefly. I think the first point I want to make, I don't want to repeat what others have said, but one point I want to make is that, I, although we are on the Russian, on the military buildup on Ukraine's border, and with good reason, um, it's visible and it's threatening. Um, for me, this all started back in January when um, ceasefire breaches began to increase and they were sustained and they were about targeted sniper fire. And that was accompanied by increased restrictions on and difficulties that the OSC monitors were experiencing trying to get across the border. The level of disinformation that was coming out of both pro-Russian channels, but also inside Russia um, was, was increasing exponentially. And pressure inside the trilateral contact group was also growing. Uh, on uh, on the Ukrainian delegation and on the president in particular. And so for me, the Russian military buildup was part of essentially a hybrid um, aggression. And uh, it needs, therefore, a response that takes into account all of that, not just the, the military buildup. Um, in terms of uh, the de-escalation, therefore, I actually think it's far, A, far too early on the military side to say that a de-escalation has happened. I think I agree certainly with uh, Anker's um, points. We have to see see how much of this actually is uh, is happening after the statement that the exercises were over. Um, as uh, Etienne said, equipment's still there, but we don't actually know how many of those soldiers leaving are a rotation um, and how many will be left there um, that represent a net increase all the way through to the ZAPAD exercise. So for me, we're still in a, uh, it feels like a, a heightened scenario, even if it is a relief to hear the announcement um, that people are pulling back. But on the political side, it still feels pretty high octane to me. Um, and therefore, the, uh, the job, if you like, the challenge for the international community is to continue to be vigilant inside the G7, in the OSCE, uh, in NATO, as Larissa was talking about, and elsewhere, to show two things. One is that uh, the international community is uh, united, which I do think was a, there was a test of us going on there. 
And I think, as my colleagues made really clear, there was a very swift and a very clear response, including holding Russia accountable, I thought, very effectively inside the OSCE, in particular on the nature of that, that build-up. Um, but also, uh, it's, uh, it's about showing that there's a cost to doing this, that the uh, international community seri uh, similarly takes seriously. And that is a thing we need to continue to pay attention to um, in, the coming, in the coming months. In terms then of, of what the Brits think about it, the ships that, were, uh, that, were, that came to the Black Sea, they were part of a scheduled visit. And the view we took was that all our scheduled activity, which is very similar to last year's ships visits and exercises that are planned, these will all continue. So we're not going to be deterred from carrying out those exercises, but nor do we think that participating in those pre-planned exercises and ha having those pre-planned visits uh, represents an escalation. It's very clear that they were going to happen and therefore they, uh, it's very important that they continue to happen. It's very important that demonstration of support to Ukraine is there on that military side, just as our military training, which we deliver uh, alongside, for example, our Canadian partners um, continues. And as you know, we uh, signed this naval capacity building deal back in October and work on that will continue. So our military, the military attention stays and at a high level and it's important. But I would also say, and then I'll stop here, that all the work that we do bilaterally and collectively on the programmatic side to support reforms and on the diplomatic conversations that we have bilaterally and collectively, including again through uh, the G7 group, which has a lot of conversations about these, are similarly important to show that while Ukraine continues to want a uh, European, a Euro-Atlantic path, we will continue to support them in that route. Because part, for me, part of that message from, uh, uh, from the Russian military buildup, as I think Etienne said, was this was about showing Ukraine that there was a limit to how strong they could be. And as Etienne said, that's a message that's been heard by investors. Well, one of the ways that Ukraine gets to be strong is by pursuing those reforms and by growing its economy and by pursuing that European and Euro-Atlantic route. So our job is to continue, even step up that programmatic and political support collectively and individually. So for me, this is an integrated package. It isn't just about how we respond militarily. It's also about how we respond programmatically and politically across this complete range of tools that Ukraine wants to draw on in order to, uh, to grow its strength. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Additional question, because uh, you mentioned a very important thing, the unity. I think that this unity of the West was uh, even very surprising for Putin because he didn't expect such strong unity, sanctions, etc. Uh, he was absolutely aware that uh, he can find uh, some real friends of Russia among the group of, of um, uh, European Union or NATO. It's, um, it didn't happen, which is fantastic. But in the last days, uh, President Zelensky offered um, uh, enlargement of uh, Normandy group, and he called to join the um, Normandy group by UK, United States. What's your opinion about this idea of, of Zelensky is realistic, not realistic, would be useful or not? This, I, th uh, I think that anybody who watches the, uh, the Minsk peace process, which has been inherently very hard to pursue, um, would be lying if they didn't say that those challenges continued, right? This is a really difficult process. And as I started out by saying, the pressure on Ukraine, uh, as far as I observe it, has only been growing, and in particular this year. But our job remains to support that format. So I think the question is, how do those who are not inside, if you like, inside the kind of circle of, of the Normandy mm -hmm. Four, are there different ways, are there more creative ways in which countries like ours can support the incredibly difficult job that France and Germany have inside to help move things forward? And that, I think, it's along those lines that we need to continue that conversation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now we have video address of Joseph Pennington, charge of the affair of the United States in Ukraine. I hope that technically it's possible to watch it. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to participate today. And I'm honored to join President Kwasniewski and my distinguished diplomatic colleagues, albeit virtually. I want to start by reiterating what President Biden told President Zelensky when they spoke earlier this month. The United States stands firmly behind the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. President Biden emphasized that same point when he spoke with President Putin on April 13th, when he highlighted our concern over Russia's sudden military buildup in occupied Crimea and on Ukraine's borders, and called on Russia 
to de-escalate tensions. As those assembled today can attest, Russia's pattern of provocative actions are of deep concern not only to Ukraine, but to the United States and our allies and partners. We recently saw the largest concentration of Russian forces on Ukraine's border since 2014. These destabilizing actions by Russia undermine the de-escalation intentions achieved in eastern Ukraine since July 27, 2020, through the OSCE brokered agreement on enhanced ceasefire measures. To be clear, this is a conflict Russia started and Russia now bears full responsibility for ending. The United States has demonstrated its resolve to hold Russia to account for its reckless actions. We will act firmly in response to Russian actions that cause harm to us or our allies and partners. And we continue to urge Russia to fully implement its Minsk commitments, withdraw its weapons and the forces it leads from Ukraine, and return to Ukraine full control of its internationally recognized borders. We will continue to watch the situation very closely. As the White House spokesperson said, our objective continues to be working with our partners in Europe to convey that the troop buildup and the escalation was unacceptable. Speaking more broadly, we will remain committed to strengthening our strategic partnership with Ukraine. Our partnership includes robust security assistance to help Ukraine's forces defend the country's sovereignty and territorial integrity, and also progress toward NATO interoperability. That support has totaled over $2 billion since 2014, including lethal defensive weapons. And going forward, U.S. European Command will continue bilateral and multinational military exercises to demonstrate our shared readiness and resolve. But beyond security assistance, another vital component to ensuring Ukraine's security is the building of a strong, stable, sovereign state that is decisively engaged in fighting endemic corruption. As Victoria Nuland, the nominee to be the State Department's Undersecretary for Political Affairs, said in her recent confirmation hearings in the Senate, corruption is also a tool the Kremlin uses to corrode Ukraine from the inside. The United States has invested considerable resources and effort in tackling corruption in partnership with Ukrainians and their government. President Zelensky and his team have taken some important steps recently, but there is a lot more to be done including those steps necessary to get Ukraine's IMF program back on track. Ukraine will not be alone. And as President Biden told President Zelensky, this administration remains committed to revitalizing our strategic partnership in support of the very important work that Ukraine is undertaking against corruption and to implement a reform agenda based on our shared democratic values. One that delivers justice, security, and prosperity to the people of Ukraine. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak today in the company of others who have demonstrated their commitment to supporting Ukraine in these challenging times. Thank you. Thank you very much for very important words. And now we have time for two distinguished guests and commentators. And I um, invite John Herbs. Both of them, they are very involved in Ukraine problems for a very, very long time. John Herbs in the years 2003, 2006 was American ambassador to, to Ukraine, now uh, working in the Atlantic Council, is still very much involved in um, Ukrainian problems. John, the screen is yours. Thank you, President Kostyevsky. I'm honored to be part of this panel. Uh, I agree with, with all of my, my I'm a former ambassador, my ambassadorial colleagues, that the reaction from the West, from the United States, from France, Germany, Britain, Canada, and others, was excellent to Moscow's provocation. Uh, you know, if I were to grade it, I would give us, give us an A minus. And I won't talk about why it's not an A. I'll only stress the positive. Uh, but I don't think it's uh, right to declare victory quite yet. Uh, Moscow has backed down. And in fact, um, I, I expected if there was a strong Western response, which there was, Moscow was not going to truly escalate by sending troops either, for example, to take Mariupol or cross from Crimea to the water canal in the Kherson Oblast. But uh, they still have a very large, much larger naval presence in the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. They still are hindering more than they were, say, six months ago, shipping in and out of Mariupol and Berdyansk, the Ukrainian ports on the Sea of Azov. And I think we could do better if collectively the United States, our partners in the EU, Great Britain and Canada 
were to make Moscow pay a price for that. That price could be, for example, putting restrictions on shipping coming out of Russian black seaports so they cannot call on ports in the United States or in Europe. But let Moscow know that just because it eased the threat of, a, of an invasion or of a renewed invasion, because we know Russian troops are still in Donbass, they paid a price for the additional pressure they are right now levy, levying on Ukraine. There's no doubt in my mind, as several of my colleagues already said, that the threat of additional sanctions was one reason why Mr. Putin decided tactically to pull back. But right now, again, you have this little flotilla floating around in the Sea of Azov. Let, let Moscow pay a price for that. And therefore, Russia will gain nothing from this latest round of escalation. But again, I, I compliment um, our colleagues in Europe, in Ottawa, for the response. And of course, I think the Biden administration did very well. And I was delighted to hear, I should have known this before, uh, French interest or willingness to send patrol boats to Ukraine, that's wonderful. Um, the more we show that we're gonna push back against Kremlin provocations and aggression, the less likely we'll face such provocations in the future. And the main focus of Ukraine's, excuse me, of Moscow's dangerous revisionist policy is right now in Donbass. So the West collectively has a clear and vital interest in making sure Moscow fails in that provocation. Thank you. Thank you, and John, one question more. Because uh, we know that just probably mid of June we'll have a meeting um, between Putin and President Biden. Uh, you have some special expectations, something can change after this meeting, because I understand the Ukraine will be one of the most important topics of this um, uh, summit. But can we expect something extra, something uh, new after this uh, meeting, or, or it would be too naive? I, to I think Biden more. has a very clear view of the danger represented by Mr. Putin's foreign policies and the interest we have both in thwarting those, those aggressive policies while at the same time seeking dialogue where we may have interests that, that mesh, for example, on nuclear arms control, but not, making, uh, not being willing to um, softly respond to Putin's aggressive policies and our desire to have conversation on arms control or for that matter, um, counterterrorism and such. Uh, I think it's smart to reach out to Moscow. One, because in a meeting at its highest level, um, President Biden can repeat our deep opposition to Putin's revisionist policies, even as we lay out how Moscow and Washington can cooperate, one, on issues which right now we can do, but two, how we can cooperate even more closely once Moscow gives up its desire to redraw the map of Eastern Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Herbs. And now, please, uh, we have uh, time uh, and uh, to the car build. The screen is, is yours. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, President. Uh, wise words have been said, and uh, I can only add a couple of comments. I mean, first, uh, at least for me, I don't know what happened. Uh, what we saw them doing was to start build up a couple of military political options. So we saw it fairly early. I agree with what said. It was the political signals where the first something was brewing. And uh, then elements of a military build up. And you can have different views on the different aspects of that particular build up. I'm quite certain that there were X numbers of options on the table in the Kremlin. I'm not certain that they had decided in advance which of those options to exercise at the end of the day. And I, 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 I think at least I could see some things building up to some of those options. Um, but I think a decision was taken rather late to back down from some of the heavier ones and then go in a holding pattern, I think uh, that's the appropriate term, uh, in both political and military aspects of it. Um, I think clear signaling from the West was important in that respect, absolutely decisive. Uh, from X numbers of points of view. And then there might have well have been other factors as well. It was said that um, here, several said that uh, the signal had been sent that Ukraine is an uncertain place for investments. Well, the signal was also sent that Russia is an uncertain place for investments uh, because sanctions could certainly quickly have a decisive impact on the Russian economy. So I, I, I think it had the crisis or the semi crisis or whatever we call it, also had a negative impact that was visible on the domestic scene or on the semi-domestic scene surrounding 
the Kremlin, that is really what, uh, what counts. As for the future, um, is it over? No, it's not over. Um, clearly not. I mean, it's not over until we have a peaceful settlement between, between Russia and Ukraine uh, on, on, on sort of the principles that European security have been built on and, and a normal relationship between those, those two countries. And uh, that is not imminent, uh, to put it mildly, and it's going to be a fairly long haul uh, to achieve that. Uh, Ukraine has been stressed by several, and I can concur with all of that, the inf internal reform processes to strengthen the resilience and the dynamism of uh, Ukrainian society and economy, absolutely critical. Uh, I would wish to add the critical comment, perhaps, a somewhat more consistency in Ukrainian diplomacy. I, I think there have been too many sort of rash uh, proposals in different directions uh, that I don't think has built the credibility that you need for a sustained long-term political process, long-term political military process uh, of the sort that is needed if you have this sort of uh, long-term strategic confrontation with a fairly powerful neighbor. Um, but that's perhaps a a discussion for another day. We are no. we are we are stuck with the Minsk format. I, I I was never particularly impressed with particularly the second Minsk agreement, but that's what we've got. No. Um, and and I think deviating from that will not improve the prospects for a settlement. Yeah, thank you, Carl. So of course, uh, maybe the Minsk agreement is not the best, but we have nothing better instead. That's that's the problem. But additional question. Uh, I think the, the unity of the West uh, played important role uh, to, to mitigate Russia sanctions, of course. But what is your opinion about Nord Stream 2? Because in my opinion, that is a very crucial project for Russia. And one of the reasons of this uh, step back of Putin probably can be connected with this, this project. What, what is your judgment? Um... I, I don't see that connection, as a matter of fact. I mean, Nord Stream 2 is a problem, but, but, but that's a separate problem. I, I, I fail to see that that came into this particular crisis. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you for this first um, uh, round. Uh, we uh, are waiting for some um, questions from the audience, but uh, until yet I have um, uh, nothing. Uh, so, uh, I have a question to, to German ambassador, if you allow me. Uh, this year, September, we have an uh, election in Germany. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel was uh, one of the strongest, maybe the strongest advocate of Ukraine, European Union. Uh, what we can expect after this election? Some changes in this general German strategy or no changes at all or some nuances? What, for what we should be prepared? That is a very good question. No, I think this is going to be the most interesting. I know this is not nice to do for the ambassador. I'm very sorry. About no, that. it's it's fine. I mean, I'm asked by everybody, yeah, and it okay. is definitely the most interesting elections that we have had in a long time because the outcome yeah. is relatively um, unknown. On the other hand, what has never been unknown is um, the direction of German foreign policy. German foreign policy basically hasn't changed uh, um, in the last decades. So, and Germany will continue to be a very staunch supporter of Ukraine and will stand side by side with Ukraine. Um, if you look at the programs of the parties, especially at parties that are high up in the polls right now, like the Green Party, they have always really been uh, supporting Ukraine in the last uh, seven years, uh, sometimes more than the actual government uh, or the actual foreign minister. So I think this is a, um, something that Ukraine can be happy about. But it is only one part of the whole spectrum. Yeah, um, the Christian Democratic Party has as um, uh, has been as supportive. Uh, um, so I, I will really. I am very curious, as curious as you, uh, what the new government will look like. Uh, who will be our next uh, chancellor? Who will be our next foreign minister? But I can reassure you, German foreign policy doesn't change uh, fundamentally with a new government. Yeah, that is the most important statement. Thank you. Uh, my question to French ambassador, because uh, many of you mentioned correctly that uh, uh, everything is very much um, uh, dependent of the reforms, inter internal reforms in Ukraine. Uh, unfortunately, because COVID, uh, our group, as a, the Alta European Strategy Board, we, we didn't visit um, Ukraine in the last many, many months. 
what is your opinion? How this process of reforms is, is going forward? Successfully, not very much successfully. We can see some strong determination from Ukrainian government to, to make all these necessary reforms. What is your opinion, please? Maybe I will ask you to that question, but I will also respond to another question that was raised by, please, please. by, by my colleague, yes. which is about the Normandy format and uh, yes, the please. possibility to extend the Normandy format, because it is a question that we have heard uh, again and again. And in this, we, are, we have no religion, I think, uh, Anka can, can confirm. We, we are very open to, to any suggestion or, or, or proposal, but, but we are to be... Um, to observe that uh, the problem at the moment is not a question of the format, but it's a question of uh, political will, and, and in particular po political will from uh, uh, from Russia, from, from Moscow, and this is a big, is a big question mark. Uh, and uh, so, at the moment, we it has to be demonstrated that another format will will, will be uh, more productive, and we we do not see that that demonstration. However, we are perfectly ready to to reinforce. Uh, a connection with with the UK, with the uh, US, and uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, for example, we 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 would be very happy if the US, the new administration, have um, a, a new special envoy dedicated to Ukraine. For example, I understand this, this is in the making, but once it, it is it it is done, that that would be, I think, a, a, a very a very positive element for. Uh, for for us as a member of the, of the Normandy regarding reforms, I think we we have we are on the same page with our uh, G7 colleagues and uh, Melinda as, as a chair of the G7 here could could confirm. We are very frustrated at the moment because um, uh, there was some good m movement, a good momentum. It was called here uh, locally um, uh, turbo regime uh, reforms. Uh, at the f it was during the first stage of the. Uh, Zelensky presidency, but unfortunately, we, we have to, to to note that it has more or less stopped, not completely, but it has it has gone uh, slowly since mid March, since a year ago, uh, more or less, for a year ago. And at the moment, there are some good intention to to revigorate this uh, this momentum, and there are some good steps in the right direction. But that's that's not enough. And for example. As G7, we have put in writing a very important document, which, which is a roadmap for, for the judiciary, because we all think that the judiciary is really the mother of all reforms in this country, and that without a fair and competent judiciary, there will be no, no progress in, in Ukraine. So we have put in writing this, and I recommend that, that you go to it and, and read it. Um, uh, and we have, we, what are our ex expectations? And it is clearly stated in, the, in that document. And so we, we continue to push for now the implementation of those reforms. Yes, there are some good steps, as I said, uh, but uh, not enough and not, um, not far enough. Uh, I can say so. So a lot of frustration at the moment. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And uh, maybe the same question to to G7 <laughs> Chairman, uh, say the Ambassador of UK. What what is your opinion about this pace of reforms and determination, especially determination, because I think that pace is is sometimes uh, very much interconnected with the possibilities, uh, etc. But political determination, that is something what is decisive factor of, of, of the reforms. What is your opinion, Madam Ambassador? You are with us or you left? No, I'm with you. Sorry. Okay, please, please. A, a mute issue. Um, so, um, the, uh, so as Etienne said, the G7 has stayed really closely focused on this. It's done a, a lot of work, met a lot of people. And uh, one of the things that we did at the height of the um, constitutional court crisis was we published a, a, a roadmap for judicial reform after the president asked actually whether we had thoughts and if we had thoughts he would welcome them and so uh, uh, we put together that work and um, continue to stand by it. So I think um, I think where where maybe I differ slightly I agree with Etienne that the pace of reform is not fast enough and we still need to see things that, that get us over the line that feel um, sustainable enough that they wouldn't be uh, weakened if you like. Um, perhaps by successive administrations or alternative approaches. I absolutely do not doubt the political will, but I really, uh, I really see the huge challenges 
in trying to achieve that step change when vested interests can or organize themselves so well to stymie it. You only have to look at, at you know, draft legislation that goes to the RADA that then buckles under the weight of literally thousands of amendments designed effectively to sink the thing or dilute it, make it harder to achieve the step change that I am absolutely certain the president wants to achieve. Uh, and I think that is a tough job for anyone. So part of the G7 group's job is to keep um, encouraging this pace of reform and indeed, as Etienne suggested, to signal where we think it's not working and needs to be working. And we do step up and do that. Um, but I think part of our job also is to signal our understanding of the complexity of this challenge. Um, and this we also do, not just in our conversations, but also in the way we communicate uh, about these meetings. And that's quite a finely balanced um, challenge. Um, but I think it doesn't do Ukraine too much service to be unilaterally on the point of pressure that you have to achieve something when we know that in order for the president to achieve these step changes, he needs the RADA to be taking these tough um, decisions to unite themselves around the reforms that uh, many parts of, uh, of the RADA are interested in, uh, in pursuing, to unite themselves around it to make it happen. Uh, and he needs the support of uh, non-governmental um, allies to um, come together and make sure that these vested interests do not continue um, to drag back the, the efforts of the presidency. So I just add that as a sort of complementary point to uh, the point Etienne was making. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question from the audience to uh, Ambassador Galadze. Um, uh, what is your response to President Zelensky's invitation for Canada to join the Normandy summit? Or format, I understand. Normandy format. Madam Ambassador. Thank you. Yes, uh, we also read that in the uh, in the FT interview that, that the president gave, um, and it's not a it's not a new idea. And certainly, we take it as a compliment to the relationship that, that and the trust that Ukraine has in in Canada that it could be a partner in this. Um, Ukraine is not a neutral party, uh, and uh, and feels very strongly that uh, about Ukraine's territorial integrity and and sovereignty. Um, we've had previous speakers have spoken about the, the formats and what they're able to accomplish, uh, how they can seem stuck in some ways, how they're imperfect. I think we have to think very strongly about changes to those formats if they're going to be made uh, to make sure that a, a, a new format gets somewhere. And we will continue to talk with uh, with President Zelensky, with his team, with Vice Prime Minister Desnikov as well, who has who has who has mooted this idea in the past. Um, uh, to get a sense from them of what kind of a role they think uh, that they think that, that that Canada could play in this, but I think because of the very strong ties that Ukrainian people and Canadian people have, um, it's at that level the peace building work that needs to happen to build that consensus for peace. Um, that's probably the first place that I could see Canada uh, playing a, a bigger a bigger role. Uh, any change uh, in the formats that currently uh, that currently exist. Uh, we will watch those very closely. We're a very interested party, and uh, and and would 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 hope that something, if something new is going to emerge, there's a we have very good confidence uh, that it will work better than what currently works. Thank you very much. And I have a last question from the audience. Roman Shinkarenko asked Ambassador Herbst. Um, how Ukrainian's military power changed since you were ambassador until today? John, please, very, very brief answer. Uh, the, the, the Ministry of Defense, up until the war uh, that Moscow initiated in 2014, um, served only occasionally military purposes. It was a place uh, where not much was happening. And we, we know that you know, Ukraine was caught completely flat-footed yeah. by Moscow's invasion. But mother, the necessity is the mother of invention and the response of first the Ukrainian society and the Ukrainian military to Moscow's aggression in 2014 has been very strong. So you now have a military which is used to fighting um, an advanced army uh, in the East and that is now able to, to impose real costs on Moscow's military, which is another reason why Moscow has not escalated its aggression in Ukraine. So while there are still serious problems with the Ukrainian military, these problems are being addressed in part with help from the United States, Canada, and other NATO allies. 
And um, it represents a serious force, which the Kremlin cannot simply um, brush aside. And that is a very good thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Dear friends, still we have five, five minutes. And um, I know that with us is a Minister for Veterans Affairs of Ukraine, Yulia Waputina. And I think it would be great to give her the floor for this some minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, I, uh, first of all, uh, want to uh, say thank you for the invitation for such high-level important discussion. I want to highlight uh, some uh, instruments, uh, some uh, elements. Uh, when we are speaking about uh, future Russian behavior, uh, we should uh, understand that for Russia it's the war of values. And logic may be not uh, the best thing, uh, logic of normal people, not the best thing uh, or instrument to analyze the future Russian policy. So uh, the intentions to restore empire didn't go anywhere for Russia. As early as the uh, millennium years, to 2000 years, Russian doctrines contains statements about the need to restore the empire based on countering a common enemy in the face of Atlanticism. Therefore, your Atlantic aspirations of the world uh, were seen as the obstacle to achieving the main goal of Russia, the empire from Lisbon uh, to Vladivostok. Uh, and the ex existence of an independent Ukraine, according to uh, Russian doctrines, meant in 2000 years that uh, all over the world declared Russia a geopolitical war. Doctrines are also had a value character. In particular, but the value of life uh, is the second value, but the main value for the Russians is uh, the uh, Russian world and Russian empire. So when we are speaking about the future Russian uh, behavior, we can understand uh, that uh, uh, Russia uh, understand themselves as the uh, opponent of all over the world because main values are not uh, existence for, for the Russian people but, uh, and Russian doctrines. And they used the soft power instrument through all over the world. Unfortunately, uh, those years, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, the world did not pay attention uh, to, the threat, uh, to these threats. Uh, and uh, at the same time, Russia continued systematic use of power tools to carry out the aggression plans. And it's not just only uh, TV movies, media centers of uh, Russian world. This uh, also um, the demographic growth of Russians in the world. They were instilled with the belief that uh, they living in foreign countries should enjoy all of the benefits of democratic civilization, but at the same time, they must remain the bearers of the Russian peace and carry its values to erode the unity of uh, leading democracies. So it's a very important thing which I wanted to highlight and our power, our instruments to counter in this real threat for all of us is the understanding the uh, reality of threats. It's strengthening our societies, it's uh, social networking uh, and media hygiene and um, countering these hybrid threats. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Minister. Thank you very much. So, uh, I think it was very, very interesting debate. I'm very grateful for all our participants, um, uh, ambassadors, uh, uh, commentators, uh, Madam uh, Minister, uh, thank you very much for participants of our conversation um, uh, from many countries. Uh, my summary is very short. So first, I think the Russian strategy, Putin's strategy is uh, the same from the very beginning. He wants to have Ukraine own zone, Russian zone of influence. And it means practically the process of destabilization of Ukraine by Russia will be continued uh, by in many forms, uh, sometimes using much more military measures, sometimes uh, much more politically or by uh, hybrid uh, methods. But that is something what uh, I think will be the part of, of uh, our life for next next years. Second, I think what we have uh, to underline very much is, is the unity of democratic world of the West, European Union, NATO. I think this unity is, is even stronger as, as me personally expected some years ago, and I appreciate it very, very much. Uh, this unity is necessary to, to continue, is necessary to strength, even despite uh, what is natural for democracy coming elections in some 
in some countries. Uh, I think this open doors to European Union and NATO is necessary to keep for, for Ukrainians, especially to encourage uh, young generation, young people uh, to, to go on this uh, way, on this path. Uh, and what I want to, to, to express, uh, as, as many uh, speakers said before, is a question of reforms. Um, uh, political will, determination, um, uh, pace of these reforms is, is something what not only we expected as a friends of Ukraine, uh, but that is very important and necessary for Ukraine. Uh, because without these reforms, it's very difficult to build democratic state, efficient state, uh, good economy, uh, interest for foreign investors, etc., etc. And of course, uh, we respect the results of, of this administration, of Zelensky administration, but we see some, some problems, some uh, slowdown in some elements today, what is, what is uh, uh, not good and is necessary to be, to be changed. So thank you very much again for this um, conversation. I want to say that um, our debate will be available on YouTube in a few days. And I want to invite um, uh, all of you for next um, conversation organized by YES online. The uh, first uh, will be organized 12th of May. And that's his panel with Atlantic Council with Derek Chollet and Christoph Heusgen, German diplomat. Uh, and so, of course, it will be about the situation uh, in Ukraine and international aspects of, 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 um, of this. And the next uh, conversation, discussion, uh, will be organized on May 18th. Uh, and that's this uh, discussion between Nell Ferguson and Farid Zakaria on the new book of Nell Ferguson, Doom, the Politics of Catastrophe. Um, as you remember, some weeks ago, we organized such discussion between Ferguson and Zakaria, but it was on the book of um, published by Zakaria. Now we have a nice, we will have a nice revenge discussion about new book of Neil Ferguson. I think that will be a fascinating discussion as usual. So that is our plan for May, still online, but uh, we have more and more, not very optimistic, but a little bit optimistic information from many countries that probably next two, three months will be closer to so-called normality. I don't know how defined this normality. Nobody knows, frankly speaking. But I hope that we'll have a chance to, to meet all of you during our annual um, YES meeting in Kiev, September. It would be great to have uh, such meeting in person. And uh, I think, uh, I hope it will be possible. So. Dear friends, um, distinguished guests, um, excellencies, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for very interesting insights. Uh, thank you very much for your support for Ukraine, because uh, that is very, very important. It's very visible and, and very encouraging. And thank you for all participants of our discussion. Have a good uh, evening or day and um, uh, stay in health uh, to the next time. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.